This is Slashers, your new favorite podcast for all your new favorite horror media. I don't know why we keep calling it new, because we've been around for a while here, so, you know, hey, you get what you get here. But yes, with me today is my esteemed colleagues, cohort, and uh, cohort. Well, see, that's what happens when Jake's not here. You start slurring your speech, and you sound worse than the homeless bum at the wagon wheel bar down the street in El Monte. So, without further ado, we got aid here. Yeah. Hey, guys. Hey, mutant goons from beyond. So, yes, that is sort of a new episode, I guess, for Doug and I, because if you guys didn't realize in this particular episode, um, you're only hearing Doug and me because Jake is not here today. So um, hopefully, (laughs) hopefully we can uh, make you guys laugh and give you the episode that you all uh, are waiting for for this month of November because we thought that we would uh, have our episodes as part of the uh, Thanksgiving theme where you eat nasty things. And what better way to start that off than with a perfect vampire horror film. So, Oh, yeah. So, I mean, like, this goes great with movies like uh, The Stuff, The Greasy Strangler. You know, you want to see your morbidly obese aunt come by and eat food at the table and just lick all around. Well, that's basically Bill Paxton in this movie. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And even if you're watching Dead Alive when you're eating the, the pus and the porridge, like those are all fun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just like that. What? New pudding. So, you know, we're, we all have uh, family members like that, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And uh, obviously, especially considering how disgusting and horrifying Bill Paxton is in this movie when he's eating people and... He, he still looks really hot doing it. I don't know how you feel about that, but that's just my thing. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Yeah, out of all the stuff, I'd, I'd say like this is probably the beefiest Bill Paxton looks in here. Because um, he was in another movie I liked, but he looked like trash. It was the the dark backward. Um, yeah, that was an Adam Rifkin movie, and I'm like, man, how did like he? That, that's the good thing about Bill Paxton. He's like those characters you can change up different outfits. You know, where you have like the three parts of their body, you switch their head, switch their torso. <laughs> He's like that. Um, and another thing I noticed too, this is big, cause this is a Catherine Bigelow film. So, you know, mm-hmm. Catherine Bigelow ended up, uh, smashing pissers with James Cameron later on and, uh, you know, making some good, uh, movies that actually won awards and stuff like that. And, uh, this film is, is very, uh, it feels very Catherine Bigelow. You go by, back and watch Hurt Locker. This movie's got the cojones. Yeah. This movie's like nonstop action throughout. Yeah, for sure. It's and it's also super poetic. And I feel that it's unfairly compared with the Lost Boys, because I feel like aside from a couple of the shots and the fact that there's a child vampire uh, and a love story going on and the girl lures the guy in. Yes, there are some things that you could compare with it but i feel tonally it's so different than the lost boys yeah and and the thing is too like i forgot I, now i'll be honest when i first watched this movie years back i ended up buying the dvd from amoebas and you hire and i it must have been like 2 a.m when we watched it we were both like kind of tired or it was a bad day or something like that and we watched it and i didn't really like the movie but for this mm-hmm. episode i rewatched it uh, two days ago i'm like holy shit this is a good movie this is up i think it's better than fright night and fright night's one of my favorite vampire movies Yeah, I I actually, I like this a lot better than Fright Night. Uh, Do I like it better than The Lost Boys? I really don't feel it's fair to compare them. So I can't say, well, I know that I've watched The Lost Boys a hundred thousand times. It is my favorite movie, but I can't say that it's any better or worse because it's, it's really its own entity. In fact, in the entire film, they never once mentioned the word vampire, which I find interesting. No, they kind of let people be like, you know what they are, we're not going to say it. But this one also feels a little bit like Devil's Rejects, like it, it's a Western almost. And the opening, uh, the first scene like where he's, uh, you know, she's seducing the guy in, in the truck and stuff, uh, that feels like a romance novel. Like, like, you ever seen the covers of those romance novels where it's like those couples just making out? Uh, that's what it reminded me. I'm like, oh man, is this is this why I didn't like it? This is very like melodramatic, but no, it's just nonstop. And this is the only movie you could see a kid catch on fire. <laughs> you know, really, I don't. Well, no, I think that happened in Cooties, but uh, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, and and that's the thing. So Homer, who's played by uh, another fun fact, but Homer, who is played by why don't I uh, John Joshua John Miller. He's actually brothers with Jason Patrick from The Lost Boys. So if you didn't know that, I didn't know oh, that. Oh, so Did maybe you know maybe there is a link between. But you want to know what? You brought up a great point because this movie is so... People don't really understand it because it's either compared to Lost Boys when it came out or nowadays. I didn't even want to buy it, but did you see how fucking horrible the Blu-ray of this looks? Did you see the cover yes. of it? It's, it, it ripped mm-hmm. off Twilight. I'm like, you guys don't know what kind of movie you have here. 
No. And I feel like that they probably would have marketed it to an audience that likes Twilight. And so if you see that cover, you probably, you know, a young teen who happened to read Twilight, which was me, mm-hmm. which I wasn't a teen. I was in college when it came out, let's be honest. <laughs> but <laughs> I know I'm showing my age here. But uh, yeah, you would pick up that because I have that Blu-ray copy. And in fact, I, ma- I lent it to my brother. So I had to um, stream it from Amazon when I rewatched it again for this episode. And my brother still hasn't watched it. I loaned it to him like a year ago. He still hasn't watched the damn movie. And I know he probably thinks it's because it's a Twilight like, movie. Oh, it's, just like a, it's like a girly movie. But no, I have like the original DVD of it. And it's like nasty. It's got like the melty uh, you know, vampire in there. I'm like, this is what they should have done. Anchor Bay did it right. For sure. Yeah, especially um, with with Bill Paxton. So we can let, let, let's let bring it around rack a little Mm -hmm. bit um and just talk a little bit about the budget and the weekend it came out and obviously it has a lot of competition because you and i i'm sure you've researched as well that this particular film near dark has not uh, did not do very well at the box office it the budget was around five million it grossed around 3.4 and it came out october uh of 1987 and so if you look at october of 1987 you have princess uh, or Prince, Princess, oh my God. Prince of Darkness, The Gate, Hellraiser, Predator, House 2, your favorite, mm-hmm. Evil Dead 2, and The Lost Boys came out before in July, so it's not even really competing with The Lost Boys. But by comparison, if you look at The Lost Boys, they made $32 million. <laughs> <They're>, compared <laughs> so, to this, like, $3 million? To- oh my God. 3.4 okay <laughs> yeah they made uh, they made basically the lunch money of what the lost boys did i know and you know of course the lost boys that had a, a a more exciting cast i guess a more well-known cast it had has the quarries uh you know jamie gertz and then we have diane weist who's popular right mm-hmm. and uh edward herman and it's just a sexier kind of movie the vampires are a little sexier than in this movie because I feel like in Near Dark they're more decrepit. They're sort of washed up. They're you can smell but, that van that they're in. Like I'm like, oh man, I know there's no one takes a shower in this van. Yeah, they're just very like uh, dirty. And in The Lost Boys, it's very glorified. Like you want to be a vampire in The Lost Boys because you know they're gorgeous. They've got that sexy twisted sister, '80s Motley Crue look, and you know the guys are all young. And in this one, they're not young, but it's fun because if you liked Aliens and you watched Aliens, uh, James Cameron suggested that the three actors from Aliens come and be in Catherine Bigelow's movie. So I don't know why more people didn't want to see it for that reason alone. So it makes me kind of sad. Yeah, it's just weird because it's not like this is one of those movies that I feel like can get like an arrow release um, just because now it's like it's really badass by itself. Like there's no point where they turn into like cheesy bats and stuff like that. You know, not knocking the Lost Boys, but uh, yeah, this one they're just kind of met like they're people you do not want to run into. They're not. That's the scary thing. They're not sexy. They're not really appealing. And these are just people. It's like, fuck, I ran into these people and I'm going to have a bad day now because they burn everything that they leave behind. Um, oh. you know, so that's, it's, it's scary. These people are bad. They are. And at the same time, I feel like we're, as the Lost Boy has a lot more comedic relief aside from Bill Paxton Severin, which uh, if I ever have a son, I'm totally naming him Severin. I'm just telling everybody that because I love that name. <laughs> but aside from Bill Paxton every now and again, when he says things, you know, you laugh at what he says, but he's still very evil and he is terrifying so frightening in this movie and so was lance henriksen's jesse and even you know um the chick who plays diamond back like she's she's so scary as especially when she's like you know switching with the switchblade and they slit the waitress's throat they're just very mean-spirited yeah they like to play with their food like that whole bar scene uh i mean i hate to keep knocking on devil's rejects but that felt like the motel i felt like rob zombie took some of that motel scene stuff from uh, near dark because that was just you know no one in that bar was going to survive you know, no, and they had to watch. It was very agonizing knowing that they're watching one by one the other people in the bar being murdered, mm-hmm. right? And there's they know there's nothing they can do. And Bill Paxton is just relentless. And you're right, they do play with their food, especially. And the little kid is so insufferable. 
Homer. The fact that his name is Homer. Oh, yeah. I'm so glad he burned up that little shit. Fuck him. Oh, yeah. He's, he's sitting, like, on the table, and he's, like, doing a clap, and he's, like, dancing when, when they're, you know, harassing the waitress. I'm like, little douchebag, go out there. I don't care if you're 500 years old or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah. And then yeah. and then they let, um, I don't know, I really like the dynamic, too, with, um, with uh, it's so different because some of the characters you root for and you feel like they're agonite. Like, when they, they get picked up by that truck driver, at first he's, like, kind of, he's like, oh, I don't want to, the truck driver, what did he do? He's a really cool guy. And then all of a sudden he's starting to make fun of uh, him and making those jokes. I'm like, okay, I guess it's his time to die now, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's sad because the, the truck driver genuinely, I felt like, wanted to help them. And and so, like, so if for those of you who haven't seen Near Dark. I'll just go back really mm-hmm. quick with the recapitation. It's about a small town farmer son who reluctantly joins a traveling group of vampires after he is bitten by a beautiful drifter. And so, you know, he's he's lured in by this chick, May. Uh, Jenny Wright, who I remember from saying almost fire, but I know she's in a bunch of other shit in the 80s. <laughs> and uh, she obviously wants to eat him is what I took it from the beginning. Like, I think she was going to kill him. Right. Mm -hmm. And at some point she changes her mind and bites him, but she decides to not kill him, I guess, because at this point she wants a boyfriend. So it's interesting that the vampires cared enough to come and get Caleb after that and basically kidnap him because they realize that he's, well, first they think that they should, you know, clean up their loose ends, right? But then eventually they realize that he's turning or he's already turned. Mm-hmm. And so they decide to take him with them. So it's kind of like they were being sympathetic, I guess, to him. Because knowing that he's one of them now that they have to take him in. I don't know what you took that as. Yeah, I did too. Well, the thing is, I felt that Bill Paxton and Lance Hendrickson, they took him in because they're like, okay, we need like a kind of like our own slave or our new, like, kind of, like, freshman, if you will, uh, to do all the dirty work. Like, when they send him out uh, during that shootout at the little uh, motel they're staying at, um, they have him, like, go out there with the blanket over him. And I don't know, I just feel like they could have used him. But, um, and then maybe if they needed to, they could kill him eventually. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I think that that, face would, that uh, fate would be worse than death, uh, being a vampire. <laughs> yeah, being that kind of vampire, because they're... There, there are vampire movies where there is, you know, let's take, for example, Underworld for lack of a better example. Well, or we could even say Interview with the Vampire. Even Interview with the Vampire, right? These vampires are very fancy, aristocratic. They come from money. Mm-hmm. They have these beautiful places that they live in, right? It's a very lavish lifestyle. Granted, neither from either movie can go out in the sun. Then you take Twilight. They can, they can walk in daylight. They have all this money. They're they're very affluent, right? So, they and they don't have to sleep. They don't have to. You know, the Twilight vampires have it the best, I, I should say. So, if you were to be a vampire, I would want to be one of those vampires because then I could have everything I wanted. If I had to be one of Near Dark's vampires, I think I would definitely want to go back and be a person at that point because they are drifters. They're broke as fuck the fact that they have to always put tinfoil on the windows <laughs> like how annoying is that well see what i want to know is like do they ever have to stop for gas like during the daylight or they just say well it's it's night so we have to go fill it up then i've always wondered that oh that's true yeah and even their masks that they wear especially lance henrickson's or jesse's uh mask that they wear when they're driving around in daylight like it's got this like bird nose covering his nose yeah they look like the plague (laughs) doctor or those mountain things from star wars and you know but i where i think that this movie excels over the lost boys in a sense is that while we are afraid of these vampires in this one we don't necessarily like them like the little boy i I fucking hate him Mm -hmm. uh we spend a lot of time and get to know them in this film and the Lost Boys, you really only get to know David. And then the story sort of centers around uh, Mike, Michael, and Sam, and then the Frog Brothers. So we don't really get to meet the rest of the vampires in the Lost Boys. I mean, we see them, you know, we, we have Marco, who's, you know, Bill and Ted, 
I, I forget which one is which. I'm probably going to be crucified for that. Uh, so we've got Marco. We've got the sexy Billy Worth character, Dwayne. Then we have Paul. And they're all gorgeous in their own right. But they are – we never really talk to them. We don't get to know them. We don't get to know their background. We – nothing. And near dark, we get to actually sit with all of them and sort of figure out even how old they are. Like, if you remember, you know, Jesse and Severin are talking at some point and they are referencing the Chicago fire that they were um, involved, that they were the reason of the Chicago fire that they set it. Mm-hmm. OK, so we can kind of get an idea of how they're hundreds of years old. And at some point, Jesse even says that he fought in the Civil War. So, you know. They're super fucking old. And, and then so you kind of realize like they, they're very weathered and you can kind of get their backgrounds of when they were changed. And you don't get that in The Lost Boys. And not that The Lost Boys is bad because you don't get that. I just feel like if we're going to have vampires in the movie, we should probably get to know them a little bit better. Yeah. And like you said, too, they definitely – Catherine Bigelow definitely nailed it where it's like Lost Boys, you want to be in that monster squad of, of vampires. It's like, yeah, these guys are cool. They're eating noodles and stuff. And hanging out. This one, it's like, no, you're basically a, a homeless guy the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, you know. <laughs> kind of, a vagrant. Yeah, vagrants kind of going from door to door. But uh, I, I'm surprised they haven't been caught yet. Imagine if you're a vampire and they got sent to jail. It's like, well, I'm spending 30 years in jail. You know, that's kind of sucks. You know. Oh, for sure. And it, I think that it would be. Because at one point, Caleb, uh, Caleb's father wants to bring him to the hospital. And he's like, no, because what would a hospital do with a vampire? Like, they would experiment. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know how they – and then how would they even keep him under control? Because as we see in the bar, we really – I mean, we sort of see in the beginning with May when um, Caleb is, you know, being a predator and he throws the lasso over her, which is like, who does that? And she – pulls him back so we see that she's pretty strong Mm -hmm. but then we don't really get to see their their entire brute strength until we get to the bar and how severin just fucking owns everybody in there right and so even by the end when he's on top of the the rig and he's punching his hand through the the top and like pulling out all the things and stuff so i don't know necessarily if they caught them unless they lit them on fire put them out in the sun how would they even control them yeah, especially if you didn't know. Yeah, it's it's crazy. But I, I did like that part where he's like, and that's brings back to what you said, where he, he's pulling him in. He's like going to use him as like the freshman or the bait. He's like, yeah, go ahead, punch this guy. See what he does. And they, that bar guy just keeps punching him in the stomach. So there you go. Just to show him. I don't know. I guess, I guess in that case, I would want to be a vampire for near dark then. Like throw him as many punches as you can. Every punch is like 200 bucks. That's a good thing of being a stunt guy. Well, yeah, and the thing is, is that when he's punching him, I think Severin does it uh, t- to sort of show Caleb, like, look how cool it is to be this, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they can take a bullet and just keep going. When Lance Henriksen is shot, when the father shoots him, and then he, like, pulls the bullet out of his throat and, like, spits it out and puts it in his pocket. <laughs> like, how fucking cool is that? So I guess there are some cool things to these vampires i just wish that they were better with their money i don't know <laughs> yeah i don't know see if i was a vampire like that i would have been smart i'm like okay i'm gonna there's cryptocurrency so i'm gonna invest in that or i'm gonna try to do something smart with this money at least i would be like a vampire in a mansion or something because mm-hmm. you know buy it off it's yours forever smart they're they're renters they're stupid it's like you're if you're a vampire why the fuck are you renting buy your own property and you own it forever yeah, and, and too, I guess if you think about it, if we want to really get deep about this, it's probably it would behoove them to be drifters because they would get away with murdering people mm-hmm. in the ways that they do a lot easier by constantly, you know, running around, right? If they were to stay in one spot, they'd have to be a lot more calculative and be a lot more, I guess, pristine while they are murdering <laughs> people i don't know like you can't just go walk up to the bar you know in the middle of a city and murder everybody and expect not to get caught Mm -hmm. so i think the way that they are very mean-spirited they're severin especially is a complete you know sociopath so being that like that and having to do that with their food or play with their food as you said which i love that you said that because it's so true i don't think they'd be able to get away with that if they wanted to be 
very fancy type vampires. I don't know. Yeah, like the Nicki Minaj of vampires. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, huh, they can't be doing starships. But yeah, it's it's crazy to think too. Like this, um, like they go from van to van, and you know, if you're a drifter, what do you do? You always pay cash, or like how? I always wondered that. Like, do they have a credit card in their name or anything like that? Like, I don't know. It's just I was watching. I'm like, it just would. It, it's weird because when I watch this, you really do put yourself in that in that situation. It's like, what the yeah. fuck would I do? Like, this sucks. I think that it would probably. I think that. They probably just go around to different bars. I think a bar would have, for them, this is me sitting on my ass yesterday after work watching this movie, thinking all of these scenarios. But for me, I would think that if they're running around, I think it would behoove them to find little shit bars like that. Because one, not only, there's probably not a lot of people who could probably murder them quickly, set the bar ablaze with all of the liquor that's available Mm -hmm. to you, or maybe do it at a gas station. You could rob the place so you'd have quick cash and just be done it's because you know that these places have cash. It, it, it probably would be a lot harder today now that everything is like, you know, you pay with everything with card. So we would, what would they get? Like a little burner credit card, like a little Walmart? Oh, a little Walmart <laughs> one? Yeah. And then they get yelled at. So like, you can't come in without wearing a mask. So the, you know. I know. So I think that I think for them that that makes so much sense and it's so smart for them to do that. And so I'm sure Bigelow was thinking this as she was writing it or thinking something, something to this effect. And I didn't want to do a lot of research. Like I found a lot of fun facts on it, but I didn't want to do a whole lot of research on it simply because I don't want to look at this movie and look at what everybody else has done. Mm -hmm. Because we know that Bill Paxton completely, you know, is Everything that he's done, he's, you know, super big and he's, you know, rest in peace. I miss him so much. I'm so sad that he's gone. Um, so it, it, I don't I feel like the fact that everyone's sort of a lesser known cast, that this does seem like a very artsy, like student films type you know, way in some ways. I think that it helps with its charm. Mm hmm. I don't know. What what do you think? Well, yeah, no, I definitely, like I said, it definitely feels very gritty. And like you said, that student feel type film, like I felt like, um, because they only filmed this in 47 days. So that's kind of, you know, that's a relatively short time uh, to film like, you know, a lot of action scenes and stuff like this. But um, no, it definitely works like the small scale of it, because everything felt small, like when they're driving in through that uh, town with the semi truck at the end. Um, like that, like no one came out. I'm like, you heard a truck explosion. No one comes out. Everyone's got their hearing aids off. Like what the fuck's going on? Um, but yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 honestly, like with, with the whole vampire stuff and you're like with them not mentioning it, mentioning it, who knows? Maybe they're not vampires. Maybe it's just like this rare, you know, it's that vampire mythology, but it could be something completely different. You never know. Um, and mm-hmm. that's up to the viewer to do. And with this being Catherine Bigelow's, uh, you know, one of her first films to do, I think this is a great start, but a lot of people still don't get it because I noticed on uh, like uh, this is ranked in one of the 200 like America's most heart pounding films. If you look at the reviews for this film, it's split halfway. There's some people that give it like four stars, like rip off of this or like boring movie, and and then there's other ones that give it really good stars. So still, this film I don't think has really found its audience because I can't recall anything that uh, like if there's been like an anniversary screening or something like that in a like a little indie theater. But this is definitely the film for it so if you guys watching uh and listening give this film a chance like ignore that horrible twilight cover yeah no for sure for sure one second let me go grab stella oh my god that's okay mr peach Sorry, I had to hide the toy. Oh, that's okay. So, um, yeah, no, I I agree, and it's 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 interesting that it is split down the middle, and I and again, I think that to the to its detriment, the fact that it came out the same year as the Lost Boys, of course, everybody's going to compare it to the Lost Boys, and you know, I don't know if it would have been better if they had waited to release it, um. Would it ruined its its aesthetic? I don't think so because if it came out in eighty nine, even if it came out in eighty nine, I think it would work. And so, 
again, I wasn't born until 88, so I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. It's not like I was there. Well, no, like, <laughs> like this film, what makes it great, like that whole aesthetic is that um, this could take place anywhere in like a small, you know, Western town, because it feels like a Western too. So really there's, there's ghost towns and like really dried up towns in Arizona that look just like this. So, you know, they could have released it later on, the 90s, you know, they didn't. People in those towns aren't really, you know, keeping up with modern trends and stuff like that. Yeah, and and even everything that they're wearing, honestly, it doesn't really date them too much, in my opinion, yeah. because everyone's just wearing t-shirts and jeans. Even the leather jacket, people still wear leather jackets like that today. So I mean, I and then he's dressed like a Caleb is dressed like a cowboy, and so those styles are still relevant. So I totally can see that, and. You know, I'm surprised no one's tried to knock this off or really tried to remake it yet. I don't know. I think they're scared of that, uh, you know, 50, the the budget of the movie versus $3 million. You know, that's kind of uh, – that sucks. That, that's, and yet you get shit like, you know, those uh, Transformers movies that people just flock to see. And, you know, art like this is going unseen. But, yeah, that's besides the point. Well, it, it is sad. And, you know, I never knew that this movie existed until I saw it. I saw clips of it on the scariest movie moments on, what was it, TNT? AMC? Mm-hmm. AMC? It was the AMC Yeah, scariest? when they do, like, the Eli Roth show or something like that. Yeah, they came out, like, uh, early 2000s. I remember I was still in high school, and I watched this. Um, and it, the counted down from 100 scary movies, Near Dark was on the on the list. And it was such a great clip they showed us of course it was the a clip of uh bill paxton walking around in the bar Mm -hmm. and i'm thinking to myself as i'm as i'm watching it i couldn't wait to see this film because i'm like how the hell have i've never seen this and just the bar scene alone because the movie i don't want to say it's a slow burn because i feel like it just starts and he meets he meets may he's bitten and now all this shit's happening to him but it really kind of shows the severity and the viciousness of these characters when you get to the bar. And just how methodical they are, as, and grisly as they are. Like, even at the when May's walking up to the guy and she's trying to calm him down and she's dancing with him at the bar. Like, even that's twisted. Like, and she's like, oh, I, I, he's for cute, Caleb. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's funny, too, because like you said, even though they they're kind of stuck like this and they have to feed... Bill Paxton, some of the other characters too, but they, like you said, they play with their food, but it's funny because they need blood to survive, you know what I mean, it's just, I think it makes it more sadistic, because if you need something to survive, you know, for example, I'm not going like this to my food, it's like, yeah, what do you think about that, mashed potatoes, yeah, I'm gonna cut you up real good, you know what I mean, no one does that, and I need to eat food to survive, they, they need blood too to survive, and yet they're sadistic with it. And, and they clearly, and it shows, because Caleb was the only one who doesn't want to kill a person, right? And it shows that they can survive on either drinking each other's blood or at the very least they don't have to bite anybody to survive. Like, they can get blood and survive off of that from either an animal or, you know, like they drained the waitress. <laughs> the fact is that they, they like to kill people because I think even if they're, a, a, let's say they're not vampires, they're not human either. And they and they have no regard for human life, and it's pretty evident that because of that, because they they've changed a child, right, and then they're willing to steal the little girl for this child who's like hundreds of years old. Mm. So it's kind of like pedophilia there, if you think about it, right? Well, technically, they <laughs> how old was how old was he supposed to be? Like two hundred or something? That little kid. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. I don't know. Well, he kept calling him old man, remember? Yeah, it's like, like, oh, old man, God. who call you calling old man? You're 200 fucking years old. Yeah. Oh, there's the El Monte. Sorry. I know, they're coming for you. Yeah. Uh, but I just think it's so good. And so if nobody's seen this, I, especially if you're not into vampire films, I feel that this is a, a great start uh, to get into the types of vampire films that are sort of relentless and they're mean spirited and they're not, they don't make you want to become a vampire. I mean, yeah. And, and, what other films do that? And even Sorry. if you're not a vampire fan, this film almost feels like, you know, they're vampires because that's their mythology, but they don't do the whole fang thing. They don't do the, the stereotypes or anything like that. So you can watch it on its own merit. Like, you know, I, it's weird. Vampires are the only monsters I really hear. A lot of people say, I don't like vampires. You know, I don't like those movies at all. If it's a vampire movie, I'll turn it off. So, yeah, just think of it this way. These are mean, brutal people that are um, having fun killing and 
drinking the blood, you know, that's some good stuff. And, and this film definitely needs it because the marketing team behind it doesn't even really know how to market this film. No, I, I mean, t- for them to put that awful cover on the Blu-ray, when when you have Bill Paxton on the on the DVD or on any other thing that you're um, that you're you're buying, and even in my background, he's not as as severe as he is by the end, right? Mm-hmm. To have him on there, I think, would draw so many more horror fans to this film alone without even like reading the back of it because he looks like a burnt zombie type i don't even yeah, know yeah that's why i said this dvd cover of it like that's that's really how it should be i know we keep mentioning it up but seriously people google that fucking blu-ray photo of it It looks like he's even sparkling and he's white and he looks very you know it, it, it's bad uh, and I, I like that turns a lot of people off like i'm almost embarrassed i'm like oh and I, t- I showed my brother this movie and he's like what movie do you want to see and i said near dark and he has Amazon Prime. He looked at it and he's like, oh, this one? I'm like, <laughs> well, <laughs> look at the VHS cover and then you'll see. So, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a big turnoff. Because I don't think, you know, the fandom of, like, teenage girls or something accidentally watching this movie thinking it's like a Twilight movie, they'll probably be like, ew, this is gross. No, I. that's the thing is that this is definitely far from Twilight. I mean, there is a love story and it is a very toxic love story because I don't think that May is good for Caleb and at all and Caleb at the beginning is just like trying to get in her pants right uh and they just keep going back to each other and I think that at some point like what does it say about Caleb that even after all of the bullshit that she put him through because it's all her fault yeah she's the one who lured him in that she couldn't kill him because she wanted to keep him and this this, and that and then at the end almost gets her family murdered and granted, she does save his sister, but by the time, you know, at the end, and he changes her back, I feel like when he's hugging her at the end of the film, she sort of regrets doing all of that because she was fine being a vampire. I don't think she's necessarily happy. Oh, hi, Mr. P. Oh, he's down here. He's hearing the mailman. <laughs> I don't think that she's necessarily happy at being changed back into a person. And, and that's another thing, too, with this film that's interesting because... They go from being vampires, but they can turn, they can go back. And there's not a lot of films that do that, aside from... Now, there goes Stella. She heard Mr. Hey, P. Stella. Aside from... What's the one? Daybreakers. With Willem Dafoe oh, yeah, and yeah. Ethan Hawke. Yeah, remember they can turn back into people? <laughs> yeah, no, Daybreakers... You no, know, this, this, this takes the cake over Daybreakers, I think. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, because the, the interesting thing about Daybreakers... Is, is that it's true what's happening because eventually they're depleting their own food source because everyone becomes a vampire, right? Mm-hmm. So that's what I would assume. Like, the vampires don't want you to know their secret because not everyone can be a vampire. How would you survive? These are the stupid things that I think of because I do love vampire films, and I think partly because I love the, the lore of it. I love I do like a good side romance, right? Um, but... The romance, I think, in Near Dark is not the the prominent story. So no, it, you're kind of going along just to see. Okay, is he gonna stick with this crew of like really bad people? It's like him getting. I mean, you could totally change this up too and not make it vampires. Make it like if you want to go drama way, it's like this guy got involved with the wrong girl and now he's in this gang of uh, you know. It could be any story like that. But um, no, the vamp. Like, this is after watching it again. Yeah, this is probably one of my favorite vampire movies as well too. Fright Night is like a close mm-hmm. second. Yeah, and, and the thing is, is that it's, with Fright Night, you know, the vampires are much more garish, right? And they, they're more in your face. They're sort of like um, how, dust, from dusk till dawn, like, they're mm-hmm. just not, not attractive vampires. And I think that there is some, there is some, something good to that, because then it creates them more as a monster, whereas you have vampires, like an interview with a vampire underworld, or even in this not this movie, I was should say, but in the Lost Boys, where the vampires are beautiful, and you you know you you are lured to them and you're attracted mm-hmm. to them, and you want to be them, and so I prefer my vampires attractive, I guess, because I mean if I had a choice, and this is kind of one, you know, I figured I'd ask you guys mm-hmm. this, but if you had a choice to be a vampire, would you be a vampire, and what type of vampire would you be from like which film? Ooh, you know, I'd have to go with the. Uh... <laughs> The near dark ones are cool, but they got a stressful life. I'd probably be Jerry Dandridge from Fright Night because I got my own house. I got a house in the suburbs. Everyone's leaving me alone. It's like, 
fuck, I could, you know, start do my own podcast all day in this house. I know. How, look at how fun that would be to be a vampire podcast. You could do it day and night. Yeah, oh, it's like, fun. yeah, call this number. I make my, uh, I get good Patreon money doing this. Everyone wants to, and, and you don't have to do public appearances, so which is nice. No. So. <laughs> or, you know, that's what I'd love to do, too. Like, you, you ever been to, I haven't done it in a while since the pandemic, but you ever go to a party and you're just like, well, now that we're getting older, it's like, oh, man, I, it's getting late. I want to go. You just turn yeah. into a bat and fly away. No one will. <laughs> I know. You can just get out of there. You're good. Um, yeah, no, for sure. For sure. I, I I think as far as, like, if I had to choose vampires, I think either... The vampires, the interview with the vampire mm-hmm. vampires are from Underworld. Um, and I guess not even the Lost Boys because their feet, when they're hanging upside down, is so unattractive. Mm-hmm. Like, ew. Well, unless you're into a foot nasty. fetish or something, you know. <laughs> oh, I guess how many people have probably watched that movie for that scene alone because they're like feet people? Oh, oh yeah. Well, God. I mean, you do get the greased up, uh, sexy sax guy, so. I know. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, you can't beat the oily saxophone guy, T- Tim Capello. And he's still going on tour. He was like in Orlando like a couple months ago. Like, are we all going to go see the sax guy? Yeah. Well, see, <laughs> when I when I seen Lost Boys, I thought that was Duke Nukem at first. I'm like, oh, Duke Nukem's in this movie. So. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, but yeah, no, I just think that I think that vampires are attractive and and. I think that the beauty of them is that they, for most intents and purposes, can't die very easily. Mm-hmm. And I do like the idea of living forever because for me, mortality is just incredibly sad to think of. Like every time I think I'm not going to be here someday, it just freaks me the fuck out. Yeah, it's a little weird like that too. And then you think of like the dark void, but then it's like, well, at least I don't have to pay rent. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, and and that's the thing, too, because I was watching a vampire documentary on stars, and John, even John Carpenter said, because some of the directors and different, you know, filmmakers were saying, oh, no, why would you want to be a vampire? That's so sad. You watch all of the people you love die. This is that. And John Carpenter is so fucking cool. He's like, why wouldn't you want to be a vampire? He's like, I wouldn't give a shit. He's like, living forever for me would be much better than having to worry about dying someday. Like, I would be totally fine with it. I don't care if everyone's around me dying. Yeah, no. Well, John Carpenter says that. He's like, he's like, yeah, I, I think I've seen that same one. He's like, yeah, I could just play video games all day. I don't care. Yeah, like, I mean, that's such a cool response. He's so cool. Everything he does, like, anytime I watch an interview, I just love listening to him because he's so fun. Um, but yeah, and so I... I Hence John Carpenter's vampires. Like, those mm-hmm. vampires were a lot of fun. And they were sort of like in a Western, too, because they're out in the desert. You know, James Woods is, you know, shooting them up and stuff like that. So that's pretty much like a vampire mm-hmm. Western as well. But I think that Near Dark beats it a million times over, for sure. It does, yeah. So like I said, people, give this movie a chance. It's it's on Prime right now, I think. So, yeah, definitely you see it, but let's, don't... don't Stop fanning your nuts to that that cover of the movie and just watch it. It's not anything like that cover. If you need to, go yeah. Google the old uh, VHS or the Anchor Bay DVD because that's how this movie truly looks. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. And and Bill Paxton, what an amazing performance from him. I think is my favorite performance of his, honestly. So, you know, if, if you love Bill Paxton and you've not seen this movie, then you really have not seen Bill Paxton, in my, my personal opinion. Much better than Twister, right? Yeah, he's basically, uh, I know he did Monster Squad, but he's basically like the cooler, the hipper version of Ru- uh, Rudy, right? Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, for sure. But he's not nice. No, he's, he's, he's bad, a bully. which makes him cooler. Yeah. So. Oh, much cooler, uh, yeah. yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, so I think this is a good place to, to come to a stop. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah, uh, I do have a message from Jake. We'll be his little messengers here. But uh, we got some sure. questions to ask. Uh, did, did he send you these questions, too? He did. Okay. He did. So, yeah. so do you want to ask them to each other? Uh, yeah, let's do that. Because we can even ask you guys, too, listening, and then you just send us a message on Patreon. If you're even going to do that. I know sometimes it's hard to you know, get your Cheeto-stained fingers flapping on the keyboard sometimes. So it's... You know. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Well, actually, I sent my responses back. So we're doing this for Joe and Sally's Much Ado About Nerding podcast. They sent us a a bunch of fun questions for something they're doing this month on their podcast. So shameful or shameless 
plug Maybe to Much Ado About we'll Nerding. See, so. <laughs> well, it probably will be after we say our responses. So do you, do you want me to ask you first? Sure. Let's see here. Okay. Let me, let me pull them up. I just saw them from Jake. Doop, doop, doop. Okay. So for our rad as fuck Much Ado About Nerding buddies... Doug, um, what's your favorite holiday and why is it Halloween? Oh, uh, you answered the obvious. Well, honestly, I could say Halloween is my favorite one. I do like Christmas. I, I love decorating for Christmas, too. Um, and, of course, we, we, we know the true meaning of Christmas, presents. So, uh, But Halloween's a lot of fun. I like decorating because you could put as much gore and crazy stuff. This, this month, uh, we made it uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space themed outside. So I kind of made my own little pinball psycho circus and... People stop by and take pictures. I think that's a lot of fun. Um, oh. But yeah, it, Christmas and Halloween are my favorite. But Halloween is, uh, you know, I get to I get an excuse to eat Reese's peanut butter cups. Oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Now, what about you? What's uh, your favorite holiday? Well, obviously Halloween. I love Halloween. I love dressing up. I love dressing up. Yes, I dress like a total slut. Except for this year, we are going as the Golden Girls. So it'll be the first year that I. I'm looking like an, an old sexy lady because I'll be Blanche Devereaux. Well, you can um, be a sexy golden girl, you know. So I, just wear with the old lady wig. The old lady wig and just wear dental floss. I, I think it'll work. So. Oh my god, I can't. So I do like uh, I do like Halloween, obviously, and then yeah, I guess Christmas would be second, only because well, actually, I love to cook. So Thanksgiving, and then Christmas in that order. So. Yeah, see, I think Thanksgiving is like the biggest scam. You want to know why? It's you spend all this these six hours cooking, you eat for ten minutes. Get the fuck out of here, Thanksgiving. I know, but it's pumpkin everything, and I just, oh, oh God, I roast my own pumpkins. Ooh. and I, Anyways, I know, so good. Um, so ne- next question. Let's uh, move in, moving right along. Favorite costume you've worn, and you've worn, worn a lot of yeah, them. I've worn a lot of costumes, whether it be for uh, movies or Halloween. Um, I think my favorite one, uh, well, back when I was in high school, I dressed as this Toxic Avenger. No one knew who I was, but uh, they're like, why are you wearing a tutu, and why are your balls hanging out, and why is your eyeball coming out? And I wore that entire thing all day. I was walking around with one eye. So that was probably my oh favorite, my but um, for the movie that's coming out, uh, it's called Alien Danger. Um, I wore costumes, a bunch of alien costumes that were huge ones, and that was made by Hunter Jackson from Gwar. So I think that's probably my second favorite is wearing, you know, because they're costumes from Gwar, so can't beat that what about you aid what's your favorite costume you've worn oh my gosh the gore ones would be really cool but um for me i was wonder woman a few years ago and that was like my favorite thing to run around in yeah we even photoshopped that in our our oh yes so i know my wonder woman outfit um and then i was yennefer from the witcher last year and so that was like my first cosplay type costume because I didn't spend my money on Halloween Horror Night, mm. so I figured I'll just spend it on dressing up for Halloween. So oh, that nice. was that. Yeah, this one, uh, um, well, this, we're filming this before Halloween, but uh, you hire and I, because we do this this um, this camp at the gym, and then we have this party we're going to. Uh, we're going to Sweet Tooth and Dollface from Twisted Metal, so I lost oh, a little bit of weight. Oh, it's going to be so fun. Yeah, and I, had to wear, I was, like, looking for the Sweet Tooth outfit, because um, he wears, like, white pants with little pink circles, but then he wears, like, this thing around his chest. And I'm like, what, what is it? It's like a little metal thing. And I had to order it from the sex shop. Um, <laughs> I don't I don't even know what it's for. I'm like, what? it's like a little circle and it has like straps around your chest. So, I'm sure you could Google it. <laughs> I didn't, and then they pulled it and I'm like, I had to order it from, uh, from uh, Hustlers of Hollywood. Oh my God, you're going to get all the dirty magazines in your mail now. Eh, Spam. I don't care. I'm like, you're like, they still send this stuff? <laughs> I know. That's so funny. Um Okay, so moving right along, um, your favorite Halloween memory? Mm, I probably have to say the one time I bit into that Reese's and there was a razor blade in there. No, that's I'm um, just kidding about oh that. <laughs> I was like, that happened. Yeah, no, no. I've seen Halloween too. I know not to put razors in your mouth, but um, yeah, no. My favorite Halloween memory is probably back in. Uh, I honestly, like, the grade school days were the funnest for me because that really felt when you could still like at maybe fifth, sixth grade. Um, cause mm-hmm. I grew up in Cleveland, so it was very like, uh, you were unsupervised, but the only problem with Cleveland is that, uh, well, Ohio in general is that it would snow a lot. So some, you know, friends would be out, I'm Spider-Man with a coat. You know what I mean? Like there's, you always had to wear a coat. I remember on Halloween. 
So, but I enjoyed yeah. it. Like the the loot, you can go around and scare your friends, and then you come home with a pillowcase full of candy. So that's really my Halloween memories. I don't have a specific one, but you know, just that childish uh, kind of memories of trick or treating. Yeah, I, I agree. It's there was something very. I think we're like the last generation to have that type of Halloween, right? Where we could go trick or treating without the parents and have a good time. And like you, I'm from upstate New York. Mm-hmm. I did. I too had to wear the coat. One year it snowed, so our uncle had to drive us around in the van <laughs> with our snow boots on and our winter coats. Yeah, yeah. I, I, find, I remember like people would dress on like I'm Michael Myers, but I'm in a with snow boots and uh, and an overall coat. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and and I don't think anyone's going to get that because even we went over this past weekend, we went to SeaWorld uh, so Dan's nephew could go trick-or-treating, his uh, nieces and nephews, and you see all the kids dressed up, they're so excited, but I'm like, they're trick-or-treating at SeaWorld. Like this, you know, it's not the same. Like they had to go up to like somebody and they dropped it through the little thing. And so there's little stations. Like it's not the same than ringing the doorbell and seeing people's Halloween decorations. And and so I feel really badly now for the kids nowadays because I don't think they're going to have the Halloweens that, that we grew up with. Yeah, and I feel bad because I know Jake took his kids to uh, the Disney one. And he said they gave him fucking cranberries. Like, yeah. like get the fuck out. I threw it back at them. <laughs> SeaWorld was giving the kids bags of Lay's. I'm like, no flavor, just plain Lay's. Oh, cheap bastards. They were probably sponsored by Lay's or Snickers or something, you know. know. That was what they had at the gift shop that was expired, so now they're going to give it out to the kids. Yeah, well, I'll admit, when I was a kid, uh, the candies I used to hate, I call them the old people candies, like the ones that, like, the little strawberry wrappers. I'm like, where the fuck do you even buy this? I know, because you know they last forever, right? Yeah. So people just hand them out every year because they can't even give it yeah, away. Yeah, it's like, here you go, kid. Don't don't mind the, the belly button lint on there. So, <laughs> Well, speaking of nasty candy, or by popular opinion, candy corn, yay or nay? Uh, well, if you like candle wax, then, you know, I'm sure that's... that's... <laughs> it does. It do, you know what? There's something savory about it that I do like. Like, I'll eat one or two. I can't eat a whole bag of them. Mm-mm. Because I, I prefer chocolate anyways. Yeah. I don't, so I don't say nay. It's okay. Yeah, no, no me gusta on my end either. Yeah, can I know that's so funny, but I do eat Peeps too, and I know people hate them. So. Yeah, well, candy corn is classified always under those weird candies. Another one I like is those those orange circus peanuts. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, you find them at gas stations, you know. But uh, yeah, I, I like, like those. They taste like chalk. <laughs> I think that's why I like them. <laughs> that's probably why. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then they asked if, have you ever played Bloody Mary or a similar game? Oh yeah. So Bloody Mary, I played it when I was a kid. I was always like, see, as a kid, I was always one of those skeptics that like when it came to like religion or like things like that, or like, Oh, you can't say that. I was always a skeptic. I was always testing people on it. And, uh, Bloody Mary, I did. I'm just like, I'm not feeling it at all. Like this, this is a scam. You guys, I don't know. We did it, but nothing really ever came of it. Uh, no Bloody Mary or anything like that. What about you? Yeah, I did it. The bitch never came, right? Same as you. And then, of course, when Candyman came out, we did it with Candyman. Never showed up. We even did the light as a feather, stiff as a board. No, Nobody floated. <laughs> no, no. And you want to know what's funny, too? I remember this was a while back in grade school again. We had a Ouija board, and everyone was so afraid to use it. I wasn't. So I, I basically pretend I'm like, it's moving. It's moving. And it basically just said, fuck you. Yeah, there's always one asshole who's moving it, but no one's moving it. No one's touching it, right? And so that was Doug. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was it. And I'm like, oh, what we need in order to get past uh, ask it the next question, we need a sacrifice of blood. So I'd have everyone. I was, I was like, bam, I realize them, but I would have they would all like give themselves a paper cut and try to like squeeze some blood on the Ouija board. Oh my god, that's awful, Doug. Well, that's what happens when you watch Ghoulies when you're like six years old. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, and then I guess, oh, yeah, and that's the last So at last uh, of the question. So if you guys want to participate in that, feel free to reach out to Much Ado About Nerding and give them your thoughts on those questions because there was a lot of fun. I think we learned a lot about each other, especially that Doug's a little bit of a masochist, obviously. Yeah, so. yeah. So next, next one, if you guys want to, uh, if you like candy corn, then you must love giving yourself paper cuts in between your toes, right? Like just... That's kind of what it's like having to eat a whole bag of candy corn. It's worse than saw. Oh, my God. That sounds awful. Uh, um, so I know that uh, I, get, I should we address it. Let's just address the elephant mm-hmm. in the room. 
for our listeners, because um, if you were, listen to the Patreon, then obviously, you know, Jake is just taking a step back right now. Um, so for our regular listeners, Doug and I are taking over the show. There's no ill will towards any of us. In fact, we're trying to get Jake to just uh, change his mind. <laughs> So <laughs> you'll find out in the episodes to come if he's back or not. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a, it's honestly like it, these podcasts are a lot of work, and Jake has mentioned that before. Um, I, uh, Jake just has a lot of stuff on the plate, and honestly, this is because we do the video, we do the audio, aids doing the editing as well too, the social media, lots of social media. So I think if I mean if you guys definitely actually that's feedback for you guys. Let us know what you think. We're we're thinking of even talking maybe one episode a month. You know. Yeah, or like doing something Mm bi-weekly and just kind of putting a different spin on things just to, you know, to set us to set us apart from every other podcast, right? Because there's so much competition out there. And, you know, really, we we need you as the listeners to listen and let us know what you want and what you think people will want. And, and we're not going to know unless you let us know. So feel free to go ahead and email us at slasherspod at gmail.com. You can email me personally, aids, aids, ade slashers pod and gmail.com you can message us on the instagram you can at slashers pod you can message us on facebook slashers podcast please uh don't find doug or me on facebook because those are our uh what is it our plebeian pages <laughs> yeah yeah it's in there you'll see a lot of things that people are like follow and share this one and it's like one of those ones with the really bad gif uh windows yeah. uh, windows movie maker stuff like, just follow and you get 10 you'll get 10 wishes if you share this okay, yeah exactly so find us on instagram i'm on instagram at pathologically ade doug's at on instagram at doug bizarro and doug also you do a show on friday nights yes yes so if you have a roku uh free in fact right now we're in the halloween uh marathon b movie tv on roku i host a show every friday at 8 p.m um mm-hmm. i do the intros and outros and uh, there's a lot of cool trailers and stuff that we show um, from local people that we've interviewed, Sam Hell, uh, you know, just a lot of good like trauma stuff as well too. Just B movies in general, um, you'll find on on B movie TV on Roku, and it's all free. Yeah, yeah, and I think that you know if you have a Roku and you haven't downloaded it yet, there's some great stuff on there. A lot of ex- obscure things, and you get to see Doug's smiling face. So wh- who wouldn't want to watch? So I really encourage you guys to you know reach out and let us know what you think about all of this and how you feel. I know that there's a lot of feelings going on with the change of the episodes, but again, we just want to hear from you and know what you think. So um, with that, I think that we're coming to a close. So any last thoughts or words, Doug? Uh, No, I just got to say thank you guys all very much for listening and please get back to us because we will respond um, because the feedback really helps us, uh, you know, improve and build up on the show to make it more of what you guys want. If you guys just want random stuff where it's like, uh, not themed or it's like you know little snippets here and there of just random comments and everything so you never know maybe we'll get up on the twitch stream soon so people can donate money to our asses so ooh, that'd be fun yeah i gotta yeah. figure out how to do that too many classes too many things to learn on behalf of doug and myself goodbye and good die